We're also following a growing crisis at the U.S.-Mexico border. Several attorneys general taking action against the Biden administration right now, including Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton. He's joining us live now. Ken, good to see you. Thanks so much for, for coming on here. Kind of explain what's, what's happening. If I understand this correctly, you're taking them on over the Remain in Mexico policy. Do you think that you have a strong case here? And explain that to me. Yeah, we do think we have a strong case. This was put in place by the Trump administration. It it was amazingly successful. Uh, it actually prevented people from wanting to come here because they knew that they weren't going to be able to come in and abuse the asylum policy. I like the asylum policy. It protects people that have been persecuted, but only about 14 percent of those claiming it actually qualify for it. So these lawyers from America will, will, would go in and tell these uh, people coming up from Central America that they could use the asylum policy, come here disappear for years because their hearings oftentimes didn't occur till later and then never show back up. So Trump said, hey, you can't do that. You got to stay in Mexico until you have your hearing, which I think was a reasonable solution. And it actually worked. So it's amazing to me that the Biden administration undid that and they didn't do it with any process. They just said it, it was over. Now, part of the issue here, too, now is the, the fact that they're moving that uh, that cap, that immigration cap, refugee cap, if you will, uh, here in the States. Um, your thoughts on that, on, on, on pushing that up and uh, the Biden administration working to, again, move that cap? Well, it's, it's frustrating to us because there's no rational, reasonable reason for doing that. We have a problem, at least on, on the border in states like Texas and, and Arizona, where we have increased crime, human trafficking, drug trafficking. The cartels are making a stronger move than they have in a very long time. It costs my state a lot of money that the federal government does not help with as it relates to education and health care and law enforcement and other costs of the state. There's really no benefit to Americans. This has a benefit that I don't see other than maybe potentially getting uh, you know, Joe Biden and his party more votes in the future. Other than that, I don't see there's no upside to Americans. We're paying for this in all kinds of ways, both socially and economically. You know, we, we've seen recently uh, President Biden, we played it on this show, him responding to reporters and essentially calling what's happening now at our borders and in your state as well uh, a, a crisis. Uh, so you're seeing a new tone continue. And again, what you and I are talking about, increasing that, that cap. Uh, but the White House admitted last week they did not even formalize any agreements with Central American countries to boost security at their borders. It simply were talks at this point. Um, but I, I, I wanted you to touch on that and, and just how far this administration is going at this point. Um, because, again, there's no formal agreements with Central America. But these, these two actions, if you will, contradict themselves because you're increasing the cap here at our borders, but you're tr trying to decrease uh, the number of immigrations happening within Central American countries. Your thoughts? Well, one, I don't think I could make sense of that because it doesn't make sense. But I would certainly say that this president has gone rogue. I mean, he doesn't follow any laws as it relates to immigration. They are irrelevant to him. They've been passed, obviously, by Congress and voted on. And these people are elected to do that. And the president said, look, I don't really care what gets passed. We're going to stop. We're going to do what we want. We're going to open the border. You can come across. We're not going to deport people that are here, not just illegally, but who have been put in prison. We're not even going to send them back. There's nothing we're going to do to protect the border. We want as many people to come across the border as possible, no matter what their background, even terrorists. We, we're not doing much to prevent terrorism as it relates to those crossing the border. There's, I mean, I don't understand it for the benefit of the American people. There is no benefit. Uh, where's Kamala Harris? I think that's one of the biggest questions. Uh, she was appointed to, at some point, lead on this front. And, and they kind of clarified it's in a diplomatic measure, if you will, with, with Central American uh, countries. But, but where is Kamala Harris? Why not a visit to Texas or to any of the border states? What are your thoughts on that? that? And do you want to see more leadership? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Where, where's, where's Joe Biden? Where's Kamala Harris? I think the answer is pretty simple. They've been pretty secretive. They're not very transparent. I've been, I just went to the detention center in, in Midland. We were not allowed to see the children. No one came out to, to tell us what was going on. The fences are being covered up and tarped over. Clearly, they don't want people, they don't want the news media to know. They don't want other elected officials to know. They don't want the people of America to know what actually is happening. They don't want people to know where these kids, when they're coming in and where they're going to what states they're in, it is very secretive. And when a government does that, it, it's pretty scary.
Ken, let me ask you this, just from your legal background, and maybe you may not be the person to ask this, but maybe you will. Uh, can't I file a, a, a FOIA request? Can I can I ask for that and, and, and get cameras in there that way? Or get we're, we're trying to get information out of how these encampments are, what the conditions are inside, without just getting someone's cell phone video real quickly inside. It's very important. You've got to have checks and balances here. It's not as simple as a FOIA request. No, it's not. I mean, you can you can FOIA things that have been emailed or or sent by text uh, or memo. But a lot of times those things aren't put in writing these days. And you can't force your way to these camps. They're, they're, you know, they're federal government property. And so they should just allow the American people to know what's going on. And I think that's why you don't see the president or the vice president. They don't want to show up in these places to draw attention, to draw attention to what's actually going on, because they don't want you to know. They don't want me to know. And they certainly don't want the American people to know what is actually happening and how bad it is not just for the American people, but it's actually bad for these kids who literally have nowhere to go once they're here. Right. Yeah. And also, we still are in a pandemic where millions of Americans are having to follow guidelines, and yet they're not being right. installed in, in these encampments there. All right. I'll leave it there. Uh, that's Attorney General there in Texas, Ken Paxson, joining us live. Lawsuits going against the Biden administration there, among several attorneys general. Ken is one of them. Ken, thanks for your time. Meantime, this across the country, gun violence and protests erupting in cities all over the U.S. this past weekend. Joining us now to discuss, former DEA special ops agents Derek Maltz, also Charles Marino, a former U.S. Secret Service agent and former Homeland Security Department advisor. Guys, thanks for coming on today. Uh, you know, over the past few weeks and months even, we've seen several mass shootings events take place. There appeared to have been a lull for a time, but we saw it in Atlanta, in Boulder, most recently Indianapolis, Austin, Louisiana, Kenosha, Wisconsin. Uh, Derek, start us off. You know, why are we seeing this increase in crime right now? Well, it all starts at the top, right? If you look at the border issues, as an example, the VP Harris is in a bunker. She's in the Washington, D.C. bunker. They're not coming out. They're not talking about the violence. Look at the summer. Last summer was violence and looting and, you know, innocent store owners, you know, losing their life savings. And nobody said a word. You know, they wanted to portray it as, like, peaceful protests, right? We all saw it on TV. There's nothing peaceful about throwing chemicals in police officers' faces, right? They leave the house every day to secure the public, you know, to keep everyone safe. And now you have them getting away with it. So until there's accountability, until there's law and order, this is just going to continue, right? And, and so we have to get the leaders to come out and talk about it. Instead, they're turning their backs on police. And that's really disgusting. Because the police are quitting all over America. They're leaving. They're retiring because they're sick and tired of the lack of support and the lack of respect when they're out there trying to secure all of us, keep us all safe. So I, I hope to see some leadership, but I don't really have too much optimism, unfortunately. Yeah, you hear about all these uh, NYPD retirements specifically and also p police officers across the nation uh, retiring or not taking interest in joining the force. Um, but Charles, you know, we keep covering, tragically so, a mass shooting after another mass shooting. And again, it seemed to have stopped briefly uh, during the height of the coronavirus pandemic, but now it's almost as though it's resuming. Uh, why do you see this increase taking place right now? Yeah, the common theme here is that we're finding guns in, in the wrong hands uh, of people that shouldn't have them. If you look at Indianapolis, right, obviously the, the red flag law didn't work. Um, you had somebody that was involved with local law enforcement interaction uh, in 2020. They were deemed to have uh, mental health issues. A weapon was taken away. And now we find that this individual was able to get access to yet another weapon and cause, cause wide destruction and death. Uh, eight people killed in, in under two minutes. So we need to look at it that way. If you look at a place like Chicago, also with guns in the, in the hands of the wrong people, criminals, you know, what we're seeing in these major U.S. cities is we're, we're seeing police not be allowed to police, right? And we're also seeing an increase in political rhetoric. I mean, look, we have Maxine Waters, a representative from California, making her way to Minnesota to cause for, you know, making calls for more conflict. 
with uh, local law enforcement. I mean, this is just irresponsible. If this were me or the other guest or you, we'd all be thrown in jail for inciting a, a riot. So, you know, everybody needs to kind of come together here, be on the same page. But really, you got to have the stomach to implement the policies that are actually going to work and allow law enforcement to do their jobs and work with the federal government to put together task forces in a place like Chicago and get those guns off the street. Yeah, again, a seven-year-old who was shot while in the car seat in a McDonald's parking lot in Chicago. This is just one example. Um, as you say, this inflammatory rhetoric that we keep seeing from, in this case, an elected official, Maxine Waters, but also I want to, want to play this for our viewers. This was what was said on CNN's uh, Chris Cuomo show, saying that the only way police reform will take place is if white kids start getting killed by police. Take a look. You know what the answer is? You really do. You don't like it. I don't like it. it. Scares me. Shootings, gun laws, access to weapons. Oh, you! I know when they'll change. Your kids start getting killed. White people's kids start getting killed. Smoking that doobie that's actually legal probably in your state now, but they don't know what it was. And then the kid runs and the pop, 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 pop. Cop was justified. Why'd you run? Oh, he had a baseball game tonight. Huh? white kid. Oh, big family. That house over there. Those start piling up. What is going on with these police? Derek Maltz, your reaction to Chris Cuomo's statement there? You know what? It's disgusting because that's part of the problem. Mainstream media is inciting violence, putting out the wrong messages. When law enforcement officers wake up every day, they go out to enforce the law. If people are not complying, if people are resisting arrest, the chances of getting hurt are going to increase. That's the bottom line. I mean, you see what's happening. I mean, it's a split-second decision that has to be made by these brave men and women on the front lines that are keeping us safe. So for national news media personnel or politicians to come out and make statements like that, it's very ignorant, and it's really insulting for all the men and women that are out there on the front lines. I, my heart goes out to them because... You know, I had a 28-year career in law enforcement. I loved every day. It was actually a high for me every day, knowing that I could save somebody's life by taking heroin off the street. I mean, look at what's going on now with heroin, right? 7,000 people have died from fentanyl, as an example, right? 87,000, that's 240 a day. You don't hear Chris Cuomo talking about that because it's going to all of a sudden, you know, go back to the border and the, and the, the radical Biden policies that's helping inflame and increase this massive death and destruction from fentanyl. But it's really, really ignorant, and CNN should be embarrassed by this guy. Maybe he should get together and, and give his uh, brother some advice on how to treat people. That would be way more productive. Yeah. Well, it, you wonder about the... Um the influence, of course, that these media figures can have over people like their viewers. Uh, I just want to show our viewers what's happening out west in places like Portland. Uh, we're seeing violence, protests, protests turn rioting, quite frankly, when you've got buildings that are being burned. They're coming from this sort of anti-establishment, anti-police angle. Um, Charles, you know, it makes you wonder, what are law enforcement able to do about this? As we see these buildings uh, growing, you know, you've got pretty sketchy people out there. You're not sure what group they're really coming from and how they keep getting away with stuff like this. Well, we're seeing an evolution, right? I mean, we had to start somewhere to get to the point where we are now in these major U.S. cities. And that is, again, the stomach for the policies and to allow the, the police departments to do their work. The community policing, the broken windows uh, theory, you know, in terms of small crimes lead to larger crimes. What you certainly don't do in places like Portland and Seattle and others is you don't give away half of your city to anarchists where they prevent law enforcement from actually going in and patrolling the areas. I mean, these folks can't even get into certain areas of their own city to investigate murders that have occurred, right? It's driving business owners out. It's driving regular citizens out. And it's just not possible to run and maintain social order when you don't allow your, your law enforcement to have access to the entire city. So this falls at the feet of the politicians. And one other thing I'll add, because it's very important, we're seeing a, a 
rather major increase of crimes and assaults and violence against police officers. And I'll tell you, that also lands at the feet of the politicians that have been calling for well over a year to defund, dismantle, call for the, the total abolition of law enforcement here in the United States. I mean, what you've done is you've attacked a, a profession of close to a million men and women and now these people on the street, the citizens that wish to do them harm, already know that they don't have the backing of these people. And yeah. so why not attack them? Why yeah. follow their instructions? You know, we, we saw it in Minneapolis over the weekend. Again, that drive-by shooting at two National Guardsmen. They were injured. Um, you know, we see it play out. Obviously, this rhetoric, it only plays into that violence and tension as well. Charles Marino, Derek Maltz joining us live. We appreciate it. Thanks, you guys. All right, check it out. Up, up. And away, the Ingenuity Mars helicopter making history um, this morning as NASA successfully attempted the first powered flight on another planet. Yeah, earlier this morning, a live stream of the flight control revealed the mini helicopter performing a spin up, take off, climb, hover, descent, landing, touchdown, and spin down. All those steps there. I don't understand. Yeah. That's a simulation. We don't have the video that everyone, the historic video. This is historic uh, simulation. You know what? I think, hey, the people people at ground control were cheering, Sean. So, you know, whatever it is, we'll take it. Ingenuity is a, is a solar-powered, apparently. So congrats uh, to everyone at NASA. Yeah. All right. I, am I am I only confused? I thought we were going to see the video, the historic video. We got the simulation. We're we got the simulation for we're gonna, you. We're going to bring That's you. That's a teaser. You can Google it. <laughs> the, that, we just wanted to make sure you're paying attention here. Google YouTube has not been throughout this pandemic, repositories of truth and scientific inquiry, but instead have acted of enforcers of a narrative. I think what we're really witnessing is, is Orwellian. It's a big tech corporate media collusion, and the end result is that the narrative is always right. All right, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis last week calling out big tech after they censored one of his roundtable events with health experts when they were discussing the coronavirus. Here to react, we're happy to welcome Florida's Lieutenant Governor, Jeanette Nunez. Uh, welcome to the program. It's so good to see you. Great. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Okay. So it seems like big tech, big media also really going after the governor of Florida here. Why do you think that's the case? Well, it seems like it's a systematic pattern to silence this governor because they know he has been strong in leading during this pandemic. He's demonstrated tremendous courage, fighting and, and really making sure that we hold big tech accountable. When you see them censoring his roundtables simply because they don't like the discussion, well, that's the basis of science, being able to ask questions and to challenge. And so when you are focused on data and science, that should mean something, but it only means something when it fits your political narrative. And clearly, this governor falls outside the confines of their political narrative that they're trying to spin. Yeah, as you say, I mean, people have so many questions. I believe this also had to do with mask wearing for children as well. So you could imagine parents have many, many questions. They just want some medical expert advice on. Um, but what interesting is this isn't the only issue that's getting some pushback uh, from media outlets or other opponents to the governor. Also, the issue of making COVID-19 passports mandatory. That was a hot topic just a few weeks ago. Ron DeSantis again issuing another ban on requiring these for both local governments and businesses as well. I, I just want to ask you, what's sort of been the response from residents when they hear that they wouldn't have to necessarily have a vaccine passport, even if they do choose to get the vaccine? Simply put, the response has been relief because a lot of folks want to get the vaccine. They've done the things that they need to do to protect themselves and their family, but there are some that do not. And we've said we're going to make vaccine access for all, but mandated for none. And so a COVID-19 passport really is contrary to our constitutional liberties. And the governor First, of, uh, first governor in the country to stand firm and to say, we're not going to require that. People are going to make choices for themselves and their families, and they are not going to require this in order to go about and do the normal things that you do in the normal course of your day, being able to enjoy things that you would normally enjoy. And, and that's something I think we really need to push because it is very scary what government wants to do, especially under this administration of Joe Biden. Yeah, I know many Americans feel that way, and because of it, they're flocking to Florida. We've got a record surge in people moving there. That is Florida's Lieutenant Governor Jeanette Nunez joining us here on National Report. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Hey, I'm Rob Finnerty. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please join the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe too. Hit the bell icon to be alerted to breaking news. And remember, there's a whole lot more on Newsmax TV, America's fastest growing cable news network. Newsmax TV, where real news for real people.